morning, congregation. Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I had an old Texas expression. I'm more nervous than a long-tailed cat in a room full of white chairs. <laughs> Not that I have a problem standing in front of people, God knows, but that's the problem itself. This young man deals with pride. And so I want to be this all for the Lord. So I covered your prayers as I go through this. It might be a hard message. It might not be. It might touch your heart. It touches me. The Lord's been working on me and trying to teach this stubborn old man some bags. And I have a chance of losing it. So I typed it all out. So I lose it halfway through. And it might come up and read through my notes. But I want to thank this church. We've been in many churches. Uh, since we joined the Adventist faith about 20 years ago, uh, and before that. And uh, this is probably one of the warmest churches we've ever been. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord. Amen. You love the 1888 message. And that's where I'm going to start my work. That's where the Lord's been working on me. I got to reading some of that stuff, and then it started getting me. Amen. And so that's going to be kind of where I go today. Uh, it's a hard presentation for me. But you all feel free to hold me to task if you like on this. I, there's one single point in the middle of this. I'm going to open the floor for some brief, brief questions or observations. That would be okay. Because I'm not a preacher. No one knows I've not been called. I can count on two hands the number of times that I stood up and spoke to preach. But I stood in front of class a lot of times. So you might hear a little bit of Socratic method here in my teaching. So anyway, before I start on this, I'm going to pray. Jesus, we want your spirit to be here. Lord, your servant wants to hide behind you. Speak the words you would have me to speak today, Lord. Bury pride in the bottom of the sea and touch the hearts in this church. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Fill us to overflow you. And let this church be a light as it already is in this community. In Jesus.
Luke chapter 7, I'm sorry. And we'll start at verse 1. I'm not going to read this all, it just take too much time. But let me paint the picture for you. Uh, uh, come on. All right, so he entered Capernaum. Thank you, sir. Uh, he entered Capernaum, and a centurion came to him. Wanted him to heal his servant, uh, actually his slave, if you will, probably. Uh, and Jesus said, okay. And so Jesus is coming along with the crowd of people following him, as well as following these servants that brought Jesus. And what was a long way off, the centurion sent messengers to them, said, Lord, and he knew that it was un unfit, the Jew would never enter the house of the Gentile. And so he was trying to let Jesus save face. But he said, I'm not worthy that you should come under my word, my, my, my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Now, if you go all the way down to uh, verse 7, I think it is. Uh, what did Jesus say about it? Uh, come on. <laughs> but speak the word, and my servant will be healed. For I am a man placed under authority, having soldiers under me, and say, listen, go, and he goes, and to another come, and he comes, and to my servant this, and to that. In other words, he recognizes the authority of Jesus, speaking for God. And when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turned to him out of the crowd and said, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Great faith. Speak the word only. That is all we need. And that's all we have. Speak the word only. Um, A.T. Jones says, Faith is expecting the word of God, will accomplish what he says, and depending only upon that word to accomplish that for which it is intended. Uh, Paul says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, of the evidence of things not seen. Genesis chapter 1. We started looking at that. We'll be looking at this next month. But God said, God spoke, and it was. The power of God is His Word. That's really all we have, because He spoke, and it was. He sees it in His mind and said, Now. And somebody said today, There's no gap between the speaking and the answer to the It's not like that. It's good. Um, justification. Justification is a right standing before all of God's laws. Uh, as if we had never sinned. I like that definition. Amen. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Anybody need peace in their life right now? Amen. Okay. All right, so, um, righteousness is to be holy, or be ye holy as I am holy. And we have to be right before God without spot or blemish, holy just as God is holy. So, with that in mind, how many of y'all are doing well in being holy in your life? Been 100% perfect in your whole life? How's that working? Is that working for you? Not working for me. So what I want to do at this point is I want to turn to uh, a little bit of church history with the, the objective to expose the righteousness by works, which is Satan's lie, and counterfeit the righteousness by faith. If we knew, normally when you want to tell somebody how to uh, recognize a counterfeit dollar, you have to look at the real one. But in this particular case, we need to understand the enemy, because the enemy has a very slippery shoe, and he's very good at slipping on you, and not just in the obvious ways. You know, I just, I know i got to work, to make, but no, not in subtle ways. And that's what we're going to be looking at for the next couple of minutes. So, uh, he, God couldn't find people that were ready, and what was the problem? All right. Ellen White says that uh, she identified the problem had drifted into a dependence on forms and rituals and the teaching of the law without the focus being on Christ. Um, she also said that it was the, it was the 
message, a clear word to the Laodicean church, Revelation 3, 14 through 19. So, in other words, righteousness by works is equivalent to the Laodicean condition. They're all one and the same thing, different names. So, now, if you want to read along with me, I'm going to read uh, Revelation 3, verses 14 through uh, 18. And to the angel of the church of Laodicea write, these things say that, Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you're neither hot nor cold. I can wish you were hot or cold, but then because you say, or we look warm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Counsel you to buy from me gold or find the fire that you may be rich, white garments that may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eyesight that you may see. So, just a quick, just a quick scan of this passage here. Hot means you're ready to go to work in the Lord's people. You buy the righteous in my faith, by faith. You're not trying to do any of it on your own. You're wholly dependent on the Lord and everything that you do. You're hot, ready to go. Um, and this occurs when we abandon all hope of achieving any righteousness by our own effort. It's only the full abandonment of hope, hope of that way. It's as in Abraham, who believed God, has counted him as righteousness. Cold, having no use for God. Right? Hang on, I can't see him, he's not there. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, it's kind of interesting, this sermon follows on close heels by the one who parade two weeks ago and last week Ken brought a message. It set this whole thing up for me. And that's God's bringing. Mm -hmm. I have rewritten the same five times. You have a copy one and three, I think. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, rich and wealthy need of nothing. In other words, pride rules the thoughts and actions. It's all about, what's this generation say? Who's it about? Me. Gold is the saving faith that understands righteousness by faith. And that's all Christ. Refined by fire, that's purified by testing, opening every nook and cranny to the examination of the Holy Spirit and let Him do His work. Revelation 3.20, right at the end of this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anybody opens the door, if you hear my voice and opens the door, I will come into Him and sup with Him and He with me. What he didn't say is, I'm going to bring the Holy Spirit with me, and we're going to bring a, uh, some mops and buckets. And we're going to go door to door. And if there's any closet you won't open, we'll leave. But if you let us go to every room and clean it up, that's what we'll have. That's what we'll do. Anoint your eyes so that you can realize that you're naked. So you can say, hey, I'm not naked. This isn't working. I need something else. Uh, white garments are the righteousness of Christ. So we kind of clear all that. All right. So, work with me a minute. This is Q&A. You can respond. Uh, salvation is by what? Grace. Okay. And uh, what, is, what is grace? Unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. Okay. But whose grace is it? It's God's grace. Is it all God's grace? Yes. Can we add anything to it? No. Really? We can't. Don't you think we sometimes have to add a little to it? Well, um, trying to make sure I stay in the right place here. Uh, all right. Another way to say this is, who is the source of all good things in our lives? Uh, for I know that, there, that in me, in me, in my flesh, no good things dwells from itself. Or elsewhere, James 17, 117 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lives. And there is no variation. If anybody sees any good trait in me, it's all there by the grace of God. Amen. And that's the message that this poor boy has had to learn because pride was very strong in me. And so we always raised. And that's the battle I fight. So I understand this one really well. Now, think about this. Think of the insanity of this. Wow. Yeah. 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 Oh, sorry. All right, think about the absolute utter insanity. 
Here is a created being whom is God who knows every atom and every particle of his atom and his body and his every thought, past, future, and now. You see, I like to think of God as not traveling with us in time, but God is in all time at the same time. Amen. You understand that? There's a little bit of a paradox there. But think of the other insanity of a created being thinking, God, I can add something to what you're doing. You need my help on something. Can you imagine? It feels like God needing something from us. It's an absolute insanity. And yet, Satan will slip that shoe on you. He will. Because he's done it to me. All right, so. Uh, so let's look at a few of Satan's lies and how we tend to drift into this uh, righteousness by works thoughts. Um, All right, here's an example. Are we still on this one? Am I making, hard, am I making trouble for you? That's all right. Okay, I'll, I'll stay over here most of the time. Um, okay, I think my sins are so bad, too severe for God to forgive me. All right, said another way, we do something really, really stupid, what a huge sin, and, we, and so we, we're afraid to come to God. Anybody ever been there? I'm afraid to come to God. Why? Because we think I've got to, I'm going to have to do something good before He'll listen to me. You ever had that thought? Or what's the other thought? You know, it's fear. We don't understand. Human followers, we want our kids to come to us when they make a mistake. All right. So there's that one. Um, here's another one. One of the ways we feel good about ourselves is to compare ourselves to others. All right. Uh, like the tax collector and the Pharisee, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like this guy. I ain't very bad, you know, and I'm very good. Got my drift there. Um, here's another one. And I may, middle, may start meddling here a little bit. Sometimes find ourselves talking to others about sins or perceived sins in third party. What do they call that? Gossip. Gossip. Okay. Um, we get proud of our works. God does something from us. Now, this is a very careful road I've been trying to walk. Uh, one of the ways I tend to do this, you can't have both on one side. Okay. No, it's me. It's okay, me. I just kind of, kind of, I'm giving the AV man fits here. And I'm also walking around making it hard on the photographer, too. Uh, and when I walk around and push buttons, I forget what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, it's, it's like I've done something for the Lord and somebody praises me for it. Ooh, that's kind of fun. I like that feeling. It's kind of like face, Facebook, you know. So when I'm done today, if the Lord bless you, just tell me the Lord blessed you. But don't tell me I did good. So now I'm on that thing. If you like what I'm doing here, you may ask, If you all would like, I've got a couple more presentations in me. One is on my experience at the Wildwood Lifestyle Center, how the Lord healed me in my miracle and that path. And I would hand out some brochures for the Wildwood Lifestyle Center. So if you're going through some really bad stuff on your body, human body, they say 95% of all uh, chronic diseases are caused by lifestyle. Amen. 95%. Yes. Now, if everybody understood that, there would not be any hospitals. Amen. There would not be any doctors. Or oh, there would be only 5% as many. So, if you like me to talk about that, tell the pastor and we'll, we'll get that scheduled. Amen. The other one I'm thinking about doing is the proper attitude for the Christian. You see, in my background, I'm using up my own time. I ain't doing that. Uh, I, I, I've been a, a, a public speaking, doing public speaking on the value of, of attitude. Up here, we just saw it. You've got the poverty mentality, and you have the abundance mentality. What's the proper attitude for the Christian? That's something I could do if you're interested in it. So tell the pastor if that's where you want to go. Okay. All right. Let me keep going down my list here. We get proud of our works. Uh, when we do something good, we hope somebody's watching. Let me tell you my story on that. I walk around, 
And on uh, Mondays and Thursdays, which is trash day, if I see trash on the road, I pick it up and throw it away. And twice on that walk when I did that, I heard Satan say, I hope somebody's looking. You hear me? It's kind of like a slippery shoe. Um, and here's the one that gets most of us. I think I'm doing okay. I think I'm good. I like people looking at me. You know, I'm, I'm going to look sharp at church. I'm going to appear sharp at church. I don't need anything. Absolutely pure oil to sin. And it's so slippery. So, anyway. Ellen White, let me quote her. Uh, when Ellen White was asked if the message rises with faith, faith was the third angel's message, she replied, it is the third angel's with verity. It is the message that we are to take the world with great power and with the outpouring of the latter rain, Revelation 18. It is to bring the same refreshing from the Lord. It is the message of salvation. It is all of God. He offers perfect righteousness in exchange for all our sins. Amen. Full and free. Praise God. Amen. Any amens? Amen. Amen. So, Christ took the penalty that we deserve so that we might have the life that He deserves. Amen. So, in the lead up to 1888, Ellen White wrote a bunch of articles. All of these are in uh, Duffield's uh, book, Rice and Death, Return to the Um but all these are in her She was writing increasingly more pointed and direct articles about turning the people back to the Lord, to shining the light back on Christ. It's all Christ. When we're full of Christ, it's going to spill out. So, and that's where, that's where I'm not. I'm not full of Christ. He's got work to do on me. All right. So, she was giving an understanding of the church which she identified as being in the Laodicean condition. Uh, I'm going to read from an article from A.T. Jones that was in a book, I hate reading, but uh, it's a really good article. And it, was, it was contained in a book, Lessons by Faith, that the pastor gave me to read. It's a really good one. And it says, the sole reason why they, people, cannot believe that God justifies them is that they are ungodly. So ungodly. If only they could find some good condition in themselves, if only they could straighten up and do better, they might have some courage to hope that God would justify them. You know, follow me? Okay? Yes, if they can justify by themselves by works, and then profess to believe in righteousness by faith. 1888, the church in 1888. That was right there. Point right there. But, it, but think about it. That would only take away a whole ground for justification. For if man can find some good in himself, he already has it. He doesn't need it from anywhere else. If he can straighten up and do good by himself, he does not need justification. Uh, and Jesus, uh, I added that, sorry. It is, therefore, a contradiction in terms to say that I am so ungodly that I do not see how the Lord can justify me. For I am not ungodly. I do not need to be made righteousness. I am righteous. There's no halfway ground between godliness and ungodliness. It's very binary. Um, but when a person sees himself so ungodly as to find no possible ground for hope or justification, it is there that faith comes in. Indeed, it is only there that faith can possibly come in. For faith is dependence upon God's Word only. So long as there is any dependence on self, so long as there is any conceivable ground for hope or any dependence on anything in or about myself, there can be no faith. So long as there is no place for faith, I don't have dependence on the word only. All right. But when every conceivable ground of hope, this is where we all need to get to, but when every conceivable ground of hope or any dependence on anything in or about myself is gone, it is acknowledged to be gone. Then every, when everything can be seen as against any hope of justification. Then it is, throwing myself on the promises of God, upon the word only, hope against hope, faith enters. And Abraham believed God, he was accounted for, for faith. To him that worketh not, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Amen. So, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, most of you, I'm going to quote the King James Version. Say it with me. 
For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay. You can see how easy it is to have a By the way, I was going to ask, anybody else have any other examples where you, you, you find yourself in a works mentality that's something like you've experienced in your own life, which is to rebuke the enemy and get the end of that work? <coughs> Anybody have an experience I want to share? I don't see it. That's getting way out of my comfort zone. Uh, as if you have to wait and a period of time before you can come for repentance because it's so bad. Right. You don't want to show up. Yeah, yeah you, 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 you skip church. You skip fellowship. And then what happens? You're, you're on that breeze uh, park slide. Yes, sir. I just wonder. I've had this for about 45 years. Sometimes I think I'm doing good and other times I don't think I'm doing good. And I just wonder... If I'm in Christ, and I really am in Christ, aren't I doing good all the time? Yes, I can wallow in my own wretchedness. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said something. He said, if I'm going to be a worm, can't I be a glow worm? <laughs> when, when do we get off our face and, and sleep on the floor before God and realize our wretchedness and get off that floor and realize by grace you have been saved and start acting like a child of the king. Ever aware of your own mis misfortunes, your own sinfulness, but pressing on. And I mean, I used to say this all the time. I'd go travel around and do concerts and people say, how many people in Sabbath school? How many people are righteous? And I'm the only one raising my hand. Because the first book I read 45 years ago was the book that you first said. Yeah. Christ our righteousness. You know, that's, I, I need to cover the answer to that question in my next message on attitude. <laughs> okay, because that's really where you get to. Okay, things are going well for me. I'm accomplishing things for the Lord. But what did Paul say? What, what, was, it, what was it that was said? What did Jesus say to them? My we are therefore unprofitable servants. Um, you remember that? If we've done something for the Lord, there's no room for us to be satisfied. Amen. Well, all we can do is praise God for our needs that He was found us worthy enough to serve Him. So I'll cover that. That's a great question. And that's a constant walk and it's a constant battle. And that's a door where Satan comes in. We need to close that door once and for all. Brother Ken, I'm just going to answer with Scripture. Philippians 3, I'm going to read 9, 10, and 11. And being found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I may might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Thank you, brother. Well said. Um, so the biggest thing you're saying is ploy is to make us is to come in in moments of pain or moments when we blow it. Satan is a wily foe. He tempts you to sin. And as soon as you do, he says, you're not worthy of Christ. So we get discouraged. And that opens the door for Satan to come in again. Our actions give ground to the enemy. Okay? And he was trying to get us on the slippery so. slope. What's that? Yes, um... The question you ask is, if we ever felt that we have done really well and we want to pat ourselves on the back, if I remember correctly. And I have experienced it, I remember I had to do pastoral prayer and uh, someone called and said, you know, they were so blessed. And I have to remind myself that all praises go to God because there is nothing good in me. 
and just to respond to the brother, I agonized with the Lord and I said, Lord, I know I have no righteousness of my own and that's why I love 1818 message with Joe.